This presentation is brought to you by the Antique Wireless Association. As a member of the AWA, you can help us preserve the history of electronic communication. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, the beginning of a single sideband. This is not a technical talk. If you think you're going to hear about uh, oh, how a balanced modulator works and uh, uh, filter versus phasing and uh, uh, the need for linearity, it's, uh, we're not going to do any of that. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, how it started. Wh where was the first time we ever heard the term uh, single sideband? And who were some of the people that developed it? And why? What were some of the problems they had? Uh, we're going to cover a little bit about uh, single sideband. And uh, because uh, there was a lot of uh, single sideband uh, work right here in Rochester, I'm just going to touch about that uh, for a little bit. So this, that's what we're going to chat about here in the first, uh, well, right. so let's, let's get going. Uh, the first gentleman we're going to talk about is uh, probably a lot of people have not heard of Major General George O. Squire, uh, but he was a pretty interesting uh, person. Uh, and we'll just go over a little bit of that. He was the first ever passenger in, a, in an airplane. He knew the Wright brothers, uh, which is how that happened. Uh, his whole career was centered around uh, communications. He had uh, over 200 patents. And one of the issues for the major himself is that all of his patents were in the public domain. Now, I don't know if that's because he was in the Army and he got a lot of the patents when he was in the Army and through the Army. Maybe they had to be in public domain. I don't know. Uh, but uh, that was a problem for George later in life. Uh, 25 of those patents were in radio, telephone, and uh, communications. Uh, George had the Squire Labs named after him down in Fort Monmouth, uh, New Jersey. There's a Squire Aviation Lab at Langley Air Force Base was named after him. And he eventually got his doctorate from uh, John Hopkins in 1893. So that introduces the, uh, uh, the man here a little bit. Uh, his unique contribution uh, was mixing radio and telegraph on the same wired line. So George wasn't into RF yet. Uh, of course, a lot of people weren't into RF yet. Uh, RF in those days was 25 kilohertz. Uh, I do that with my uh, ST70 amplifier. Uh, but, uh, but George was working at those frequencies and mostly on the, uh, on the telegraph. Uh, so here's his, his patent. Uh, January 3, 1911, um, multiplexing tele telephony and uh, telegraph. And down inside the middle of that, uh, uh, that uh, patent, you'll find this term, the first time we ever heard it. Uh, he used frequency div division multiplexing uh, in a telephone system by first modulating with single sideband uh, to several subcarriers, et cetera. So that's the first reference uh, we ever have to a single sideband in 1911, even though it wasn't applied to RF as uh, we think of it uh, today. So we need to at least mention uh, General George Squire. Uh, he started, uh, he at least termed, uh, got the term out uh, in front of all of us. But let's look at uh, some RF applications. Uh, the first time we saw anyone working really with RF uh, using single sideband was uh, John Renshaw Carson. Uh, John worked for AT&T or Bell Telephone uh, uh, Labs throughout uh, his career. Uh, he took Squire's patents and was able to ex 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 extract, if you will, uh, find the principles of the single sideband radio transmission in theory. So this is the first time we had single side adapting uh, the RF. Somebody's playing with their microphone. So, so uh, John Renshaw uh, Carson applied for the patent of a uh, uh, single sideband as applied to uh, radio uh, on December 1st, 1915. Boy, he must have really bothered the, uh, uh, the patent department because it took 17 years 
before the patent was finally uh, issued to uh, uh, the Carson. So there, there must have been a lot of uh, unknown uh, items going on in that uh, in that patent. Uh, so let's see what George, I'm sorry, what John did with that. Uh, Carson single sideband transmitter used a balanced modulator. There's a term we heard with a filter type sideband selection plus linear amplifiers. So this is his, I hope you can uh, all, uh, all see that. Uh, this is his contribution to the first application of mainstream single sideband uh, RF communications. So here's his transmitter that he developed with AT&T. Forget this up here. This is a three phase uh, AC power supply. But down here at the bottom, we have a, a balanced modular. We got audio come in, we got RF coming in. We have, oh, well, I'm not, not sure why we did that. Okay, we had uh, uh, the balanced modular and then we, uh, uh, we filtered that and then we did it again. He did that just to change uh, frequency. Uh, but then we filtered and then we had the first amplifier, a 750 watt amplifier uh, driving a 15 kilowatt amplifier, driving a 150 kilowatt amplifier uh, out to the antenna system. And what this was, was AT&T's first attempt at long haul radio telephone. So that was uh, his contribution is how do we finally get uh, communications across the Atlantic with something other than uh, Morse code. Even though the code was working fairly well, uh, we had uh, a lot of good transmitters. We had uh, Alexanders and Aldenators running uh, good signal in New Europe, running 100 words a minute uh, uh, tele uh, CW, teletype. I'm sorry, not teletype, uh, CW. Uh, so it was working well, but all of the telephone people, they wanted desperately voice communications uh, across Europe. So this is what Carson uh, did for us. Let's see what, uh, how he made that work. Uh, over here on this side is the uh, single sideband generator uh, with a 750 watt driver driving one, two, three 750 watt tubes. Uh, in the uh, first uh, linear amplifier stage. Uh, the intermediate PA used two 10,000 watt water-cooled tubes and they're right, to, they're right here. But the new tech, some of the new technology was the use of uh, linear amplifiers. Uh, heretofore, we were just into high level modulation or maybe Heising modulation, uh, but it was always at high level. Uh, so this is the first time we developed the signal at a low level and made big use of uh, high power linear amplifiers using new water-cooled tubes. Uh, here is Miss, Mr. Housekeeper. Mr. Housekeeper was the inventor of the metal to glass seal, which is the only way you could get really high power vacuum tubes because they would always fail at the seals uh, before this. Uh, so Housekeeper was a great help to uh, AT&T in making this 150,000 watt uh, transmitter. That very tube that Mr. Housekeeper is holding uh, is in the AWA museum. It's broken. But the paperwork that came with the tube told how Mr. Housekeeper broke the tube and very carefully looked at all the metal, the glass seals and said, this is gonna work. Uh, so yeah, we're very happy to have, uh, have those tubes, a lot of, uh, a lot of history there. Uh, so now we have uh, uh, 150 kilowatts of uh, RF. Uh, this this is hap just happened to be a picture of the uh, six phase uh, power supply and these big inductors here are glitch, uh, devices to protect the thing from doing really bad things when the tubes arced over, which they were kind of uh, prone uh, to doing. So it turns out that 150 kilowatts uh, operating at 58 kilohertz 
in the RCA's long wave antennas at the Rocky Point worked uh, fairly well. And 150 kilowatts into a three mile long antenna uh, should tend to do that. They put a hundred microvolt signal into uh, the UK, but unfortunately it wasn't 24 seven as desired. If you're running telephone circuit circuits, you ought to be able to do it 24 hours a day, which was the goal and something that the, uh, uh, they really had to work on because they weren't there yet, even though uh, they were getting signals into uh, uh, the UK. So in 1923, uh, H.B. Taylor, president of AT&T, spoke from this, his headquarters in uh, New York to Southgate, United Kingdom, and that started a long and successful single sideband voice telephone service in New York. That service ran for 33 years until 1956, when they laid the first uh, uh, transatlantic telephone cable. Uh, so that's pretty remarkable. 33 years for a, a single sideband service uh, started by John Crenshaw. This is a receiving plant over in uh, uh, the UK. Uh, it's a Western Electric's uh, site. Uh, later, it was moved to uh, Scotland to utilize the new beverage antennas. Anybody know why beverage antennas are in uh, uh, Scotland? It was a 1921 transatlantic test. Uh, when W2ZE was sent by the ARRL over to Scotland, to receive the transatlantic test messages, guess who uh, he met on the ship? There on the ship was Harold Beveridge. And they got to talking, and Harold said, let's build some of my antennas. And they did, and that was probably some of the success of the uh, transatlantic test and uh, the work eventually by the, uh, uh, the AT&T. Uh, they started to use beverages. Uh, that wasn't uh, at first, however. Uh, the first uh, receivers uh, uh, was a dual conversion filter type with the BFO injected directly into the uh, antenna. So here's the BFO. Here's the antenna. It was a loop antenna at that time, uh, right into uh, a super app. Here's an HF uh, detector. Excuse me, HF uh, detector. Uh, oscillator, filter, intermediate frequency, and detectors and audio amplifiers to make up the rest of the uh, uh, receiver. And again, later, the antenna was changed to uh, uh, the beverages. This plaque was uh, was on the building. It's, well, I, I guess it's still there, if the building is still there. Uh, building 3 of the Western Electric Company. I'll read that for you. I don't think you can see it. Uh, this plaque is set, boy, maybe I can't see it. This plaque is set here to record that the first spoken word from Western Hemisphere to these islands was received in the grounds of this factory 14 January 1923. Uh, so that, that's, that's nice. It's historical. But it's not correct. Uh, the b before single sideband, the A and T T and T tried to send uh, uh, a, a, a AM voice to uh, Europe uh, using another voice transmitter, but it was a two thousand watt uh, AM transmitter, Heising modulated, two hundred and fifty fifty watt tubes in parallel. Uh, using the three tower uh, and antennas at Arlington, uh, Virginia, and the receiver was the Eiffel Tower. And the listeners sat there and saying, I think that was a word. Was that a word? Was that a word? Uh, so it wasn't successful, but they did get some messages through, and then the war came along, and that was, uh, uh, that was all dropped. Uh, so regular Europe to... Uh, uh, U.S. sideband telephone service started in 1927. A three-minute phone call took eight employees, four on each coast, to ride the gain, to adjust the BFO, 
do telephone interface connections and what have you. Uh, so a three minute phone call costs seventy five dollars, about twelve hundred dollars uh, in today's money. Uh, so there are a lot of issues, but it was a start. And one of the issues was kind of the new engineering term of the day, and that was signal to noise ratio. They weren't quite understanding why some days a signal was just really loud. And I shouldn't say some days, but some hours of the day. And then other times it was uh, pretty, uh, pretty bad. Uh, so they were learning about signal to noise ratio. They were learning about propagation and they were learning about uh, uh, better antenna and better receive techniques. It's interesting to me to think that right away, they started improving receive techniques as opposed to, well, let's just build a bigger transmitter, which they could have, uh, but they didn't. They went and uh, uh, worked on the, the re receive techniques. By the way, I did, if it wasn't clear, I should say this was a two-way communication. It was telephone after all. Uh, doing a one-way communication wouldn't, wouldn't satisfy uh, television users, I'm sorry, telephone users, and it certainly wouldn't satisfy the uh, board of directors of uh, Bell Telephone. Uh, so it was a two-way setup. So they had transmitters uh, in the UK as, as well as uh, receivers in the US. And I should say only because I like to brag a little bit about the AWA, one of the big improvements in receiving uh, technology was the use of uh, triple diversity triple space diversity uh, receivers. We have one of the uh, AT&T triple diversity receivers in the uh, AWA museum. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing uh, to behold. And uh, so there were, there were changes and improvements all throughout the 33 uh, year life of this, uh, this program. But if you, if you have to point to one thing that brought single sideband to the forefront it was AT&T's uh, radio telephone communications uh, going on in the, uh, in the 30s. We should also remember, and history does quite well, uh, value the amateur radio operators in the contribution to a single sideband uh, technology and bringing the... Uh, uh, that top technology to uh, to use. So let's learn a little bit about uh, how that uh, happened, and it happened slowly. It wasn't a it wasn't a big deal in the beginning. So let's look at the very first introduction of a uh, uh, single sideband to uh, the ham community. And it was in the R nine magazine, which is a pretty good uh, uh, magazine in its day. Uh, it, it was equivalent in its day to. Uh, uh, QST and CQ magazines. It was a well-known, well-respected uh, ham radio magazine. Uh, and a man by the name of Robert Moore, W6DEI, uh, wrote an uh, introductory article to a single sideband. Uh, it wasn't really a build-it article. It was more of an uh, introduction in, in what it was and how it could be helpful to the uh, to the amateurs. It had a really minor impact at the time. One thing you have to remember is the time. It was 1932. Uh, there was some, something called the depression going on. People were more worried about uh, where is dinner coming from tonight than where can I get parts to build a uh, single sideband radio, uh, which was very difficult to do. The receivers could have never withstand uh, the uh, uh, not well, not sensitivity, but uh, they drifted way too badly. And the biggest thing is there was no perceived need. Uh, there was a little interest in uh, radio telephony uh, building up uh, day by day, but uh, really no need. The bands weren't so crowded that you needed a uh, transmission mode that had uh, more efficiency and narrower uh, bandwidth. Uh, so we think that only uh, six were, uh, were ever built, but at least that was, uh, that was the start. 
little progress going on through the Depression and World War II uh, and the amateur side. But then in 1948, uh, Oswald Villard, W6QIT, uh, put W6YX on the air. That was a Stanford University's club station uh, using a homebrew single sideband transmitter. Uh, he didn't, uh, it wasn't a how-to article, it wasn't a build article, it was just kind of an introduction. Hey, this is what we're doing. If you want to hear us sometime, listen to us on 75 meters. If you can, call in. But that, but that's all it was. So it was a, a kind of a reintroduction of, hey, this is single sideband. It may be something we need someday. But following this, a, a reader of this article uh, really kind of took it to heart. And uh, that, that person was Don Norgard, W6KUJ. Uh, Don actually designed a complete uh, single sideband transmitter and had it published in uh, Hand News. Uh, I don't know how many people remember this publication, but that was pretty good. Uh, I have several copies here. They, they were well-written. They were technical. They were correct. Uh, so it had a good, uh, it had a good following. Uh, so Don published this, uh, had a very simple uh, design. Uh, it had uh, only three tubes and five watts. And if you had a skilled workshop, you could build it and you could make it work. A skilled workshop in the 1950s uh, was having an oscilloscope. You sort of had to have an oscilloscope to align this. And one difference between the 1932 announcement and the 1948 announcement is now the post-war amateur bands are getting pretty crowded. Uh, so there's all of a sudden people are thinking about, you, you may remember in the time period, narrow band FM on HF on 75, uh, they were trying uh, a lot of things to uh, uh, get around some of the, the QRM issues. Uh, so here it is, very simple circuit, three tubes, 12AU7, 12AT7, and a 6AG7. Uh, so it, uh, it would actually would uh, work uh, pretty, uh, pretty well. A lot of people uh, built uh, that circuit. Another people that kind of was following in the background uh, was a person by the name of Wes Shum. Uh, Wes had an electronic... Uh, manufacturing business. It was kind of like a job shop. You would go out and he would get to, uh, do I have to worry about that, Lynn? What are you worried about? My screen just came up and said, you're sharing and I don't, is that a, a timer or something? Uh, oh. No, it should be just fine. Okay, it just popped up on my screen. Okay, so anyways, uh, Wes Shum, Shum sorry, always had an uh, electronic manufacturing business, a job shop, but he just wanted to be in the radio business. He just had that in his heart. So he took Norgard's SSB Junior uh, Circuit. It was published in uh, GE Ham News, and he turned it into a viable product, and he called it the Model 10A. And with that radio, he started Central Electronics Incorporated in 1952. And that was the first uh, amateur radio-related uh, uh, single sideband manufacturer. Uh, so West did uh, pretty good. Slow but steady. The 10A brought a Model 20A. Uh, these were a successful money-making product. Uh, and uh, one thing that uh, West Shum did... Uh, he used hand-to-hand -hand marketing. Boy, did he visit Hamfest, and he took and demonstrated radios wherever they would uh, uh, they would listen to him. And here it is. Here's the bread and butter product, the uh, 20A, 20 watt, 160 through 10 meters, AM, sideband, CW, and phase modulation mode. Nobody knew what phase modulation mode. Nobody knew what it took. All it took was another position in the switch because uh, it's always there. So anyways, he was also a good marketer. And he had Vox. First time people were introduced into Vox circuit. And that was good or bad, depending on your point of view, I guess. 
Uh, $280 wired and tested. Some wanted to grow as the uh, demand for single sideband increased. He was approached by a chap by the name of Joe Batchelor. Joe Batchelor had an idea for a unique broadband RF circuitry that would require no tuning of the radio that would revolutionize the, uh, uh, the industry. Uh, Joe would be chief engineer for the next eight years, and this is one of his products, the uh, Central Electronics 100V uh, transmitter. Uh, this is a, a photograph of uh, uh, Wes and Joe uh, at yet another ham fest uh, demonstrating uh, a single sideband to anybody who has listened. So here's a, a rack mounted 20A. Uh, here's a uh, later 600L, an early 600L uh, lamp amplifier, linear amplifier, a uh, VFO made out of an OBC 458. And their sideband slicer. This was their receive adapter, which worked amazingly well. I have one in my basement today. Uh, and of course, uh, you have to have this the light bulbs so you could see the efficiency of the single sideband transmitter. When you stop talking, the light bulbs go out and you're not generating any power. Believe it or not, that was a big deal. That was a big sale point. Uh, not as big as, I don't think, uh, this one. Uh, this is another demonstration. Uh, here's Wes tuning. I don't know what that is. It might be a 51J series, but it's a Collins radio. And I think Wes must be taking great pride in uh, taking a Collins receiver and enabling it to receive single sideband using the central electronics uh, sideband slicer, along with a 28. Uh, so yet another uh, demonstration by Wes and the boys. But does anybody recognize the VIP and their early single sideband advocate in the audience here? Just that be the guy with the black glasses? The guy with the glasses, Barry Goldwater, W7UGA, is taking all this, uh, all this in. So good. And, of course, we know Barry was a great advocate of uh, single sideband. So here's a thoroughly modern uh, sideband station of uh, uh, the 1950s. Again, a, <laughs> I love uh, marketing. So here's a... Uh, uh, here's another picture of a fine Collins receiver only able to receive single sideband because of the central electronic slicer. This was a switch. Oh, what did they have? They, uh, they called it, they, they, they didn't have an upper and lower sideband. They didn't call it that. So this is sideband one and sideband two. But the upper and lower sideband wasn't in common use uh, even, uh, even yet. Uh, 20A running a ubiquitous high power linear amplifier. And of course, people started owning oscilloscopes. So that was a very well-equipped uh, sideband station of the, uh, of the era. The 100V uh, and 200V uh, transmitter and the 600L linear amplifier was the highlight of central electronics. Uh, it's what West always dreamed of, uh, but they had, uh, they had problems, and the problem was the cost of manufacturing. Uh, and, of course, the wideband circuitry, the fact that once you adjusted these and some controls behind the panel here, all you had to do was throw the band switch and turn the dial, tune the radio, blew the competition away. It was wonderful. Uh, and of course, the building scope was a you know nicety of the of the day. I hate slides like this because they're just too busy, but uh, they're just too much to go through here. So here's a problem: uh, the factoring, the funding was too light for the product 200V and the 600L, and the selling price was too high. The 200V was $800. 
the 600L was $600. So that's $1,400 in 1960. That's $12,000 in today's money. So that was a real problem for Central Electronics, especially since the Collins 32S won. Their biggest competition was only $665 uh, compared to $800 for the, uh, the Central Electronics. So Shum West went looking for, for help, and he found it in a very unlikely source, and that was the Zenith Radio Company. Zenith Radio Company also, number one, had money. In the early 60s, this, this was a clue. If you were making money in electronics in the 1960s, you better go work on Mel Electronics because that's where all the money was. Uh, it was incredible the people who were starting in Mill Electronics in the uh, early 60s, including my company, uh, how I got started. Anyways, uh, Zenith Company started building uh, stuff for Central Electronics. However, things happened very quickly for, uh, for Zenith. Color TV, printed circuit boards, and high fidelity. All things that Zenith were really good at. So they looked at that again and said, goodbye, uh, Central Electronics. We're not doing this anymore. Uh, so Wes pulled the plug in 1962. He went back to his manufacturing business, which was okay. And Bob went to Hello Crafters, and that was okay. So that was kind of the end of uh, uh, Central Electronics. But that was the major, major uh, company in the early uh, early 60s. Let's look at some others. Another copycat of the sideband uh, 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 article in uh, GE News uh, was a company called Eldico. Well, Eldico was okay. They had a pretty good uh, line of products. But the interesting thing is that Eldico and Central Electronics had to pay a royalty to every single product they sold because that article appeared in Ham Radio News. And Ham Radio News says, if you want to use that, you got to pay us. Uh, so I don't know much about uh, being a, a lawyer and all that, but uh, uh, somebody made out well, and it probably wasn't Central Electronics or uh, Eldico. The next major input, uh, if you will, into the ham market was cheap and easy single sideband by Anthony Vitali, W2EWL, 1956 uh, QST article. And it was a right formula at the right time. Number one, home brewing was still popular, uh, easily converted and plentiful uh, World War II command sets uh, were available, and uh, they did the trick. So this article showed you how to take a, a command set Add a couple miniature tubes, uh, add a BMW phase shift uh, uh, network. The five megacycle VFO was already in the uh, surplus uh, equipment. So all you had to do is add a nine megacycle oscillator. And you took the five megacycle VFO and uh, added it to nine and made 14 for 20 meters and uh, subtract four from five or subtract uh, five from nine, make four, and you're on 80 meters. So it was very simple, uh, very easy to build, and it, uh, uh, it worked uh, actually quite, uh, quite well. Here's one I think. This is a picture of one that's in the AWA Museum. I don't know, Lynn, does that sound from, look familiar? It doesn't matter. if, uh, uh, but I, I, think, I think it is. But there are lots of these uh, uh, out there at, uh, at one time. So it was a very popular and a, another uh, addition to uh, single sideband for the amateurs. Uh, receiver uh, was not overlooked in all of this. Uh, there were products uh, showing up all over the place on uh, product detectors to make your uh, receivers uh, a little easier to, uh, to copy. And of course, crystal controlled uh, BFOs or upper and lower sideband selection were very popular. So manufacturers just jumped in uh, to get aboard. Uh, and if you didn't have the word product detector and selectable, <laughs> selectable sideband in your uh, brochures, uh, you weren't going to make it. Those are must-have in any modern uh, 
receiver going into the uh, single sideband uh, era. And even though we know that uh, the amateurs uh, were really very helpful in bringing the single sideband to uh, to life, uh, we can't overlook the effect of uh, uh, military electronics. Uh, you know, here's General uh, Curtis uh, LeMay. He was legendary in uh, promoting single sideband into the strategic air command and converting everything from uh, AM to a uh, sideband uh, for all of the Air Force, all of the uh, airplanes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so even though Collins Radio, who is a big supplier, a huge supplier of the uh, Air Force, uh, was not first and not necessarily very innovative, but boy, did they have aggressive marketing. Uh, the story goes that uh, Collins guy might work and work and work and get uh, an interview with uh, Curtis uh, LeMay, get in his office, talk for a couple of minutes about, here's our new KWM2. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Here's what it'll do, but don't let me tell you about it. Hey, you should try it. And then you get up and walk away and just leave the transceiver on the desk and say, here you are, have a good time. Uh, let's talk just a very little bit about uh, single sideband in Rochester as we uh, start to uh, close here a little bit. Uh, for those of you who weren't uh, in the area, uh, we have Stromberg Carlson, great uh, uh, manufacturer, electronic manufacturer uh, during the war and after the war. Stromberg Carlson uh, led to General Dynamics. General Dynamics uh, moved out of Rochester to go to Texas. There are a lot of very good uh, engineers and what have you, leaders in the single sideband, that we don't want to go to Texas. So they stayed here and formed a company called RF Communications uh, in 1959. And then in 1969, RF Communications changed their name to uh, our, uh, Harris Corporation. Uh, and the rest is kind of history. At the same time, scientific radio systems uh, also opened up here in Rochester. They were a, a sort of a competitor to RF, uh, but not uh, not so much. And they're uh, they're gone today. Uh, sideband Technology was an interesting company, uh, Companded Sideband. Uh, but there, even though it was a new mode used to uh, compress sideband and put a lot of information on one channel, uh, there wasn't uh, wasn't a need. So the only one left uh, today is uh, Harris Corporation. Couple Harris Corporation pictures out of my files. I love marketing, but I sure wish I was there to help them. Here's a nice, here's, you notice that here's a guy talking on the, uh, talking on the microphone and here's the microphone. There's nothing plugged into it. There's no wires on the CW key. If I was there, I would have fixed that. Uh, here's the uh, engineering lab working on the one thing that made uh, Arva Communications uh, the huge success it is today. Uh, they were working on a program, single sideband, one kilowatt shipboard uh, equipment for the Navy, and they had to win. If they didn't win, they would not have made it. Every single penny that went into this project. Of course, they had really, really good people. Uh, that's me. I look at this picture a lot and I wonder, why did I have short pants or long socks? Well, anyways, that doesn't matter. Uh, one of the other advents of uh, uh, help, helpful things that came along to uh, get single sideband going in the amateur uh, community was uh, single sideband adapters. Uh, we'll look at a few of them here. Look at this, one, two knobs, one, two knobs, one, two knobs. Okay, so the heat at the Viking, the B&W, uh, not that. Anyway, those, uh, uh, everybody had phasing type single sideband uh, uh, side adapters. So you would hook these up to your uh, heat get Apache, your DX100, uh, any, your B&W 5100, uh, your Viking Valiant, 
and you could convert them into a single sideband. So they were pretty popular, worked well for a short period of time until the manufacturer said, eh, we might as well just build sideband radios. Now, this was uh, early Collins, uh, the first uh, transceiver, uh, given credit for the first trans transceiver where receive circuitry and transmit circuitry uh, were combined in several, uh, several areas. Uh, and of course they had the unique ability where they would transmit and uh, receive exactly on the same frequency. So that was, uh, that was very unique. So in 1957, uh, the transceivers came out and uh, well, the rest is uh, history, so to, so to speak. Collins KWM2 sold for in the thousands all over the amateur and military market. There were a zillion of them uh, in the Mars circuitry in uh, Vietnam. Uh, I have one of these in my basement right now. Uh, when I got it, I didn't know it, but it was on Mars. And I, boy, I couldn't get this thing to transmit on 20 meters. Uh, but it, uh, uh, it's a great work in radio, even today. They're trouble-free, just amazing uh, uh, product. And there's, of course, the S-Line, which was everybody's uh, dream radio. Helicrafters, of course, was huge. Uh, HC 37, another phasing radio, not one and two. Uh, and the SX 101A was a 70 pound radio. You got to give it to Halicrafters. They, uh, they wanted to build a radio that would be rock solid, a tunable slide rule dial radio. And they put 70 pounds into that thing and it worked, uh, worked pretty well. National, uh, of course, there's a long, long, long history of great uh, receivers uh, prior to World War I. Uh, Post-war, they added uh, single sideband equipment uh, ready to enter the mill market like everybody else was doing. They didn't quite, uh, they didn't quite make it when they put, again, all their eggs in one basket, uh, so to speak, to develop what was called the ND777 exciter, which was going to be the exciter for every piece of military equipment they made. Uh, it's going to be used on the FRT 83, 84, 85, 86, uh, which uh, one to 40 kilowatt transmitters. And they, they just couldn't do it. They couldn't meet uh, demand. They couldn't meet uh, deliveries. And uh, that's what put... Uh, our beloved national radio company out of business is uh, they could not survive in modern solid state electronics. Kind of a shame. Hey, look at this. Talk about uh, uh, the difference between central electronics and the rest of the world uh, was Swan. Uh, there was $600 less than a Collins radio. Uh, they sold a ton of them. Uh, into the uh, uh, hand market because they were cheap. They used uh, cheap parts, cheap tubes, 750 watts PEP with two television sweep tubes. Uh, you better have a lot of spare tubes on hand. Uh, 350 was a big seller. One of the issues was uh, they came out with a nice, cheap, easily converted uh, radio that would go on the CB bands with no trouble at all. And that was a little problem for them. Heathkit, yeah, how can you not love uh, Heathkit? Uh, I had this SB uh, 300, 400, and I didn't have the control, whoops, didn't have the control console, but uh, uh, yeah, that was a good, uh, good pair that I used those for, for quite uh, some time. Drake, of course, was highly sought after then and today. Uh, their first uh, radio was a Model 1A in 1957, and they just made the receiver, and they just made a lot of good equipment ever since then with the TR3s, TR4s, TR5s, 7s, and the long line of great uh, uh, receivers. It's an R4C. Uh, Lynn Bisher and I have a constant argument about uh, uh, I have uh, the R4B line. He has the R4C line. I always say 
the R4B is a far better receiver than an unmodified R4C. To make an R4C as good as an R4B, you got to add filters, Sherwood filters, and uh, so uh, Lynn and I will have another argument about that next uh, next Tuesday. So there, there's there's really a lot more we could talk about tonight. We're getting sort of uh, long in the uh, time, so we'll uh, we'll quit here. But there, there's one more thing I got to share with you, and that's the uh, that's the final chapter. And now you know the rest of the story. Remember George, George Squire, the general who gave away all of his patents, 200 patents, and he never got a dime for any of those patents. Retired military back then. Uh, There's no pension plan like they have uh, uh, today. So, you know, uh, he wasn't going to go broke. He wasn't going to get in the soup line. But, uh, uh, you know, he just didn't have much to go on. He kept one business. He kept one business. It was called Wired Radio. At the time, there was a movement to use manufactured names like Kodak, Xerox. George Squire thought a little bit, and he selected the name Music. And he lived happily ever after selling elevator music. And he did okay. So, uh, hey, folks, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did putting that together. Remember, Shares program, AWA Shares, is going to be every month uh, from now on, same time, same place. So uh, come on down and join us again.